much like in 2016 when I went in search of the infamous Saxon Walt Shabin. We'll put a link to that story down below, if only to prove I too once had hair. We're going in search of the Russian side of the story on the Russia-Ukraine war. War, conflict, special military operation, call it what you will. So much of the framing around the conflict has been from Ukraine and Western media's perspective. That's because there's a language barrier and Russia today, the only English speaking Russian source of news uh, was blocked on DSTV. We've spoken to Ukrainian members of parliament. We've spoken to the Ukrainian ambassador to South Africa. We've spoken to Ukrainian war correspondents. We decided it's time to go and get the Russian perspective. In January this year, prior to February the 24th, leading up to February the 24th, President Putin, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, a lot of leaders in Russia were saying they are never going to invade, there's going to be no military action, the buildup of troops on the Russian border is simply military operations. What changed? Um, you yourself have even been quoted prior to February 24th saying that no military action was going to take place in Ukraine. What, what changed? So, to answer this question, let's change the verb. It's not that anything changed drastically. It's rather how the situation evolved. Uh, I said myself and our, our Russian officials said on various levels that we will not take military action against Ukraine. That's true, but uh, this further proves the point that our special military operations in Ukraine was a forced move. So Russia did not want to do this uh, voluntarily, uh, just because it wanted to. Like the Western media now try to represent special operation as something Russia did like on a whim, like for, for no reason, but, but there were reasons. Uh, first of all, that Kyiv regime has demonstrated its full incapability of uh, upholding its promises or sticking to the agreements it signed. Uh, moreover, the well, as it was later discovered during the special military operation, the Kyiv regime's forces were trying were preparing for a full-scale assault on Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic. So it was a well, you you may call, might call it a preemptive strike uh, because uh, well, the Kyiv regime was apparently uh, preparing uh, to for a full-scale full war. Uh, to, to up the hostilities in, East, in eastern Ukraine. And on top of that, President Zelensky declared that Ukraine had plans to um, restore its nuclear arsenal, so to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, Kyiv regime is, the, the, its Nazi nature is no mystery, well, at, at least for Russia. Uh, so Nazis with nuclear weapons, for us, it equals end of the world. So Ukraine was demonstrating its aggression uh, and its unwillingness to uh, to hear and to understand Russia's concerns about Russia's national security. It was an issue of national security, so we had to, I repeat, I stress it, we had to launch a special military operation to demilitarize and to denazify uh, Ukraine. Hmm. I've, I've heard you say in the past in other interviews that you've done that you don't consider Russia crossing the border with its military an invasion. And you said, quote, invasion has an aim to occupy. If your aim is not to occupy, just state for me very clearly what Russia's aim is in Ukraine. The aim of Russia uh, is to denazify and to demilitarize. Demilitarize means to, to render the capabilities of Ukrainian's regime uh, to, to, the, to the level that it does not pose a threat to Russia or to anyone else for that matter, because Ukraine is n Russia is not the only bordering country of Ukraine, uh, and to denazify it, because unfortunately, Nazism and neo-Nazism, ultranationalism, they all flourish in, in today's Ukraine, and we see evident signs of it, so we need to denazify it, because uh, we cannot afford another appeasement policy towards Nazism in Europe. We all remember distinctively what happened last time when Europe uh, worship the the policy of appeasement towards Nazism, I mean Nazi Germany. The most destructive war in the history of humankind started afterwards. And uh, should another world war start, I mean World War Three, there is no guarantee that it's not going to be the last war on earth. 
We can't let that happen, especially Nazism with nuclear weapons, as I said in the pre in the previous question. So yes, and uh, we call it special military operation uh, for for the reasons that we don't. Uh, the, the objective is not to occupy Ukraine, and uh, besides, our military capabilities and our personnel are limited in Ukraine. We don't use the full force. It's far from uh, our military capabilities that we demonstrate in Ukraine. Uh, the Western media try to pose it like uh, the Ukrainians are vastly outnumbered, practically to make an image of heroic resistance. But in fact, uh, it's the exact opposite. So the Russian forces are outnumbered, vastly outnumbered by Ukrainians. So this is a limited uh, use of force. That's why we call it special military operation. And secondly, it's because the objectives are to denazify and to demilitarize, but not to occupy. Denazifying, um, I've seen a lot written about the Azov Battalion, mm -hmm. and there is a well understood, a generally understood neo-Nazi uh, side to that, um, and that I think is generally accepted. Mm -hmm. But is it not an exaggeration from Russia's side to say that, you know, or everybody running around in Ukraine is a Nazi. And if you look at, I'm sure, the well-quoted statistic, the ultra-nationalist right-wing bloc only got 2.3% in the 2019 parliamentary elections. It's a tiny, tiny number. It's, it's almost insignificant. What, what's Russia's response to that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, not everyone in Nazi Germany were actually ideologically Nazi. It didn't prevent this country to start the Second World War, and it's universally acknowledged that Nazi Germany was, in fact, Nazi. Uh, of course, not 100% of Ukrainians are Nazis. We don't say that. Uh, but Nazism has deep roots in Ukraine, neo-Nazism and ultranationalism. Uh, there are a lot of manifestations to this, uh, aside from what you, what you mentioned. Soviet uh, symbols... And Nazis, uh, the Soviet symbols are banned in Ukraine by law. They're even uh, written there in the law, name by name. So the anthem, flag, hammer and sickle, red star, uh, and all manifestations of like Soviet legacy, even the orders uh, and, dec and state decorations are banned from public demonstration. They're just outlawed. But not Nazi symbols, not swastika, not SS emblem. Uh, in Kiev and in other major uh, Ukrainian cities such as Lvov, uh, the commemorative parades were held in, uh, in, in, in honor of the Galicia division. It's a Nazi division formed of Ukrainian volunteers who served under the Third Reich. Yes. So uh, the commemorative events guarded by police. So it's a state approved policy. Nazism is not persecuted in Ukraine. It's guarded by police. So they held this commemorative events in, uh, in commemoration of Stepan Bandera and Roman Shuhevich. I just remind for the, our distinguished audience that uh, Roman uh, Shuhevich and Stepan Bandera were Nazi World War II collaborators who executed and killed thousands of people, such as in Volinia Massacre. Volinia Massacre uh, took lives of approximately 50 or 60,000 innocent people. This is Nazism, this is pure hatred, this is genocide. So uh, the landmarks, uh, well, such as streets and well, monuments, monuments to Soviet leaders have been dismantled, and uh, the streets and, and other uh, geographical marks has been renamed from, this, from, from, the, from names in honor of Soviet heroes who liberated Soviet Ukraine from Nazism in honor of the Nazi collaborators such as like a tram depot in Kiev. It was renamed after Roman Shuhevich, a Nazi collaborator. So uh, the Azov Battalion, it's not the only battalion, mind you. There are also Aidar, Kraken, Tornado, other, other battalions that also worship Nazi ideology. And the Nazi ideology is deeply rooted within the Ukrainian armed forces. Ukrainians said themselves that the Azov is now a part of uh, Ukrainian military. Yeah. It's not a redeeming factor. By all means, it's just a Nazi unit. It's the only country in Europe that has Nazi units incorporated in their armed forces. The only country in Europe. And um, moreover, the, well, the situation in Donbass. Uh, for eight years, the innocent people has been killed in Donbass. For eight years, uh, Kyiv regime has been bombarding civilians, killing children, women, elderly people. 
So this is pure hatred. This is uh, this is genocide of ethnic Russians and Ukrainians and everyone who lives in eastern Ukraine. How, how do you identify the Nazis in Ukraine? As you say, it's deeply ingrained on Russia's version. H how are you identifying the Nazis? The conflict, the war, the special military operation, we can call it what we will. Civilians are dying, troops are dying. Are these all Nazis? No. Uh, we, we can't just go, go around and pick, uh, cherry pick every, everyone, a Nazi or not. As for civilians, uh, it's a good thing you, you brought this up because, well, the, the Ukrainian side uh, blocks the humanitarian corridors that's heading east towards Russia. Russia has already received uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees from, from, from Ukraine and would have received even more. But Kyiv regime tries its best to prevent people from going eastwards uh, to, to Russia. Uh, are they willingly going to Russia? The, the narrative yes. I'm sure you've heard is that they are almost being translocated without their permission, given Russian passports. Um, no, they, they go there willingly, and especially in the eastern regions of Ukraine. For eight years, Kyiv regime has been bombarding those people. I'm pretty sure they're going uh, will willingly because they have nothing to do with it. They don't want to be uh, involved with the Kyiv regime anymore. Because, well, allow me to get a step back here and get a proper context of what's going on in Donbass. Because it's not just, uh, well, two sides uh, fighting. It all started in 2014. In February 2014, when unconstitutional coup took place in Kyiv. Uh, there was an agreement between the the then Kyiv, pres uh, the then Ukrainian president uh, Yanukovych, and the Ukrainian legitimate government and the opposition, Ukrainian opposition. Uh, it was guaranteed by the European powers, so Germany, Poland, and France. Regardless of that, on the very same, on the very next day when this agreement was signed, it was just abandoned by the uh, by the opposition, and they took power by force. So this is just an unconstitutional coup, and Russia dragged attention to this fact of Europeans, has been dragging attention to this fact for eight years, but we were basically get its, uh, well, none of your business response. Um, afterwards, the, well, Crimean referendum happened, and the Donbass region, they disagreed with unconstitutional coup. And what they got in response was not a dialogue, was not a uh, search for compromise, not a... Uh, not an attempt to reconcile somehow. They just used military force against those people. There were no Russian army. There were no army at all, for that matter. Not propped up by the Russian military There was just, just mil mil militia, people's militia. But they had to defend themselves somehow. Because your, your kindergartens, your schools, your hospitals, your residential areas have been bombarded from, artil from artillery for eight years. There are kids who were born in Donbass f if, since 2015 and, and later. Just imagine, it's 2022, so they should be around seven or eight years old. They should be in schools. They're not going to schools because they can't. Their schools are either destroyed or they're just living in shelters, uh, afraid of new attacks from uh, coming from the Ukrainian side. Just uh, yesterday, there was another heavy bombardment of the city of Donetsk coming from the Ukrainian side. They keep bombarding the civilians, not Russian military, not militia, civilians. Uh, to get the scary pictures for the Western media. So for eight years, these people have been living in fear. And what is, uh, what's, their to blame? what's their fault? What's their great sin or crime? Their sin or crime, I'll use the quote marks here, of course, is just they wanted to, they uh, opposed to the unconstitutional coup. They wanted to preserve their ties with Russians and uh, or just become apply to Russian citizenship. Yeah, they, they associated themselves uh, with, with Russia, and that's their crime, and that's what they're punished for by the, by the Kyiv authorities. And for eight years, just let me, let me finish this one, for eight years, Russia has been trying to drag attention of the civilized West to this, to this problem, to the people dying for eight years, but none of the Western officials actually spoke of this. They came to Kyiv, they praised Kyiv for democratic reforms. They spoke about anything, you name it, but not, not the problem in Donbass, not the massacre of people in Donbass, not literal genocide. And when our president described it as genocide, the German Chancellor Scholz uh, described it as ridiculous or laughable. For us, it's nothing laughable about people dying. It's nothing laughable of getting people, people getting slaughtered. 
So for eight years, we were trying to find dem di uh, diplomatic solution. And we came up with the solution, Minsk agreements. Uh, but Ukraine said it out loud and just will, will, with no, uh, no shade of doubt that w they were not going to implement Minsk agreements. They said it themselves. So they are consistently, with full acquiescence of the West, with full support of the West, they sabotaged every single diplomatic approach by Russia, including that in late 2021 when we addressed the NATO and Washington with um, draft agreements on security. So we proposed this decision to us, and what we got in response was nothing but arrogance and complete disrespect to our, to our position and our concerns about our national security. Well, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. NATO expansion eastwards for two decades, Ukraine's decision, and, and they're still um, deciding on that, it's something still under consideration now, uh, the application to join the European Union. If you consider Ukraine a sovereign nation, should sovereign nations not be able to decide their own foreign policy? Yes, that's true. They should be deciding their own foreign policy, but, uh, well, Russia is also a sovereign nation, I remind you. We also have to take measures to protect our security and safety of our peoples. Because the problem is not Ukraine itself. They keep uh, referring to this argument that Ukraine is not on par with Russia when it comes to military might. True, but the problem is NATO using Ukrainian territory as a foothold against Russia. Uh, because uh, if this happens, if Ukraine just will fully fledged, we don't even, uh, it's not even the matter of the formal, um, formal admission of Ukraine as a NATO member, even close cooperation to the extent that NATO can use its territory for military purposes is a danger for us. And we said this to our Western partners, we said this to, well, we used to call them partners, uh, to, to the West, we said that to Ukraine, that this is the red line, this is the huge c concern to us. So we need to address this collectively somehow. Uh, but So it's everyone's business but Russia's. But our security concerns is Russia's business uniquely. And uh, besides that, um, there is an OECE commitment under the Istanbul document of 1999 uh, that uh, the, it's, well, in Europe, that the European, can, well, the country, I mean European because it's, it, it, it concerns the European space, country must not uh, upgrade, bolster its defenses and its security at the expense of hindering others' security. That's what we said to Ukraine. So this is, uh, yeah, you enhance your defense, but you hinder our defense. What are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And they said, like, well, NATO expansion, we have this open-door policy. It's never stated anywhere in NATO's document. It's, uh, like, it's a new know-how. Uh, well, we were surprised to know that NATO actually has an open-door policy. So it was an expansion eastwards, and let aside the fact that the West, uh, the West promised us not to expand NATO eastwards to begin with. Not that they violated this promise to us. They moved as close to Ukraine, and we said it, that this is the red line. You, you cannot do this, because this is a direct threat to Russia's security. We had to respond somehow, and we... We exhausted every single opportunity to resolve this issue diplomatically. All of this could have been resolved. All of this, the special operation never would have happened if Washington and NATO listened and, leg and genuinely uh, addressed the issue that we were raising, right? the issue of insecurity, uh, of, of Russia's insecurity with regards to NATO's expansion. I, I hear you call it the Kyiv regime. You don't often call it the Ukrainian government or something like that, as if uh, President Zelensky is not the legitimate leader. Um, is there something illegitimate here? Did 73.2% of the vote in 2019, does Russia not consider President Zelensky a legitimate leader? Uh, no, it's not the case. We call it Kyiv regime uh, because of what this regime did to ordinary people, to, to Ukrainians, not just in Donbass mind you. They committed numerous atrocious crimes uh, back in 2014 and later. Uh, e even now they use the, their civilian population as human shields. There's a good reason why they don't allow people to go, because if they stay in big cities, they serve as human shields for the ultranationalists and for the Ukrainian forces. That's what's stalling Russia's progress, because they're literally hiding behind the backs of, uh, of, of civilians. 
uh, use them and taking them as hostage. That's terrorist tactics. So on the 2nd of March, the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly uh, voted against or voted for a, a resolution affirming Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity. It was 141 out of 193 uh, member states. That's 73 percent of the world. There were five people who voted against it and 35 who abstained, including South Africa. But that's an overwhelming number of the world that looked at Russia's aggression, Russia's actions in Ukraine, and called on Russia to withdraw. On, on what basis does Russia disregard that overwhelming sentiment in the world? It's not about disregarding the sentiment of the world. Uh, it's... I guess it's the wrong angle to look at it. We did this not because we wanted to demonstrate the world how we disregard its opinion. No. Uh, Russia does what it had to do. I keep stressing it. It's a forced move. Not that we wanted to violate uh, the, the borders, not that, we, not that we wanted to start the military operation, but we were left with no other choice. With no other choice. And uh, the desire for peace is natural for human beings. We understand that. And uh, to more, uh, to, to add more to this, um, we in Russia, we see this, this conflict firsthand because Ukraine is our, is our brotherly nation. Uh, still, regardless of everything that's happened, we still regard Ukrainians as our brotherly, as, as brotherly people. Because uh, the, the, the marriages between Russians and Ukrainians, joint families, it was all like natural way of things for us. It still is, actually. It still is. Uh, even before the special operation started, millions of Ukrainians migrated to Russia, worked in Russia, married to Russian nationals, applied for Russian citizenship. Mm, so we, we enjoyed really strong ties. Mm. But uh, contrary to the natural way of things, the Kiev regime wanted to sever that bonds to promote Washington's agenda of NATO expansion. And uh, that's just one way to put it. And Russians and Ukrainians we do regard this. It's a tragedy, first and foremost, for Russia and Ukraine. It's not a matter of conquest, prestige, or anything. It is a matter of forced move, of forcingly defending your national interest with, while you're left with no other means of defending it. The EU, US, UK uh, all reacted with, with quite strict sanctions against Russia. The EU recently agreed to ban 90% of Russian oil imports by the end of the year to cut off funding for Russia's military action. Are those sanctions working? I know you haven't been home in a while, but you must speak uh, to your compatriots back home. Are sanctions working? What's life, back, li life like back home? Well, the life is... Life is still okay. Uh, I won't say that we don't feel the pinch of sanctions. Like mm, we don't, we don't feel it. Of course we do. Uh, of course uh, the sanctions, well, to a certain extent, affect uh, Russia's economy. But Russia's economy adapting uh, to to new reality because the West demonstrated its willingness to. Uh, well, he ba it basically declared information and economic war on us, uh, on Russia. So we're adapting to new realities, and there. The West is trying to represent itself as the entire world. The West is not the entire world. There are a lot of countries uh, across the globe that still cooperate with Russia and we cooperate to our mutual benefit. Uh, so we're just adapting, finding new markets. So sanctions are never good. And it's a double-edged sword because well, the Westerners, they also feel the pinch of their own sanctions. And we warned them about this, that uh, you're not, it's not going to go past unnoticed uh, back and back in Europe and Western Europe and even in US mm. uh, still they want it's a politically motivated decision uh, it's information and economic uh, warfare it's been called the stealth missile the global food crisis Russia's blockade of the Black Sea mm -hmm. um, what is Russia's response to this uh, creating a global food crisis is Russia responsible no, the, the short the short answer is no. Uh, well, let me start from the sea blockade, or rather the so-called sea blockade, because there's no such thing as Russian Black Sea blockade. Uh, we have created the humanitarian corridors to make the grain, because we're speaking about the grain yes. that's still stuck in the in the Ukrainian ports. Uh, the Ukra humanitarian corridor humanitarian corridor has been operating since 27th of March.
if my memory serves me right, that's the exact date, 27th of March. Ukrainians do everything in their power to prevent this humanitarian corridor of being actually fully operating. There are still dozens of uh, various vessels still stuck in Ukrainian ports, and they mined uh, the ports, the Ukrainians themselves, with outdated mines. Uh, it's not the modern cutting-edge technology. These are outdated weaponry, uh, and this is this makes them harder to detect them because they sometimes they just get off their anchors and they just drift. Nobody knows where these mines are. So uh, there is no, literally nothing uh, f coming from Russia that's blocking this grain from transporting. Uh, no. So, this, so the actions of the Ukrainian authorities is the only reason why this grain has been uh, blocked in, in, in the ports. And uh, getting back to sanctions and these, uh, the food crisis, the problem with this looming looming, I should say, looming food crisis, is not about that we don't have enough food or enough grain or enough whatever. The problem is that the chain supply has been... Um, uh, has Di been Disrupted? Yeah, dis thank you, Th that's the word, disrupted, uh, because of the Western sanctions. Yeah, we live in a strange world, Alex, where images and video are shown on television, on social media. One group of people will be shocked by it, Another will say that those images aren't real, that they are actors playing dead people. Mm -hmm. Is Western media conspiring against Russia? Should Russian media be the only media that the world trusts? And Russia Today, RT, it's no longer available on DSTV locally. W do you consider that censorship? Uh, well, the blocking of Russian media, uh, especially when it comes to the, the Western part of the world, uh, yes, that's censorship in full sense of word. It's just an element of the information war that's waged uh, against our country. Uh, Is that information war not going both ways? Uh, well, it's not. We uh, we are fighting them because well, the let me explain. Again, a case by case basis. Uh, so the Western media blocked has been blocking Russian media. I mean, the Western government has been blocking Russian media long before special operations started. So long ago, uh, even even earlier than 2014, the scale though is just yeah it was like it got really upgraded uh, lately due to special operation. They had like they think that they have this uh, you know a good pretext of doing this, but still it's illegal. There's nothing wrong with Russian media. There's literally they do literally nothing uh, for them to be blocked. If you truly worship the pluralism of opinions and freedom of speech freedom of expression, uh, all those freedoms that the Western has been boasting of, uh, you keep them intact. But no, it's the exact opposite, uh, because well, just, they just declared, declared propaganda and, clo uh, and, and locked it. Uh, just took it off air, like RT Deutsch, uh, the German division of RT. It was taken off air only six days after it actually started, it actually started broadcasting. Even the channels, like in Latvia, Russian channels that have nothing to do with politics, their content is purely beyond politics. They're also blocked. So there's nothing, uh, there is political motivation behind the sanctions and behind this blocking of Russian media. So they're just trying to silence everyone who speaks something that doesn't match with their own position. So, and uh, getting back to your question that if the Russian media is the only media to be trusted, well, of course not. Because uh, if we if we pose the question like that, that means that we're presuming that there are only Western media or Russian media. But there are other medias of other countries as well, like Chinese, Indian, well, South African, um, other medias. Uh, they, their voices also need to be heard. And we do not against, we're not against that Western media should speak and, well, deliver their position. Uh, we can disagree, of course, yes, but uh, it's not that we would like like the Western media to disappear and let only because that's also a censorship. Mm. But uh, that's what they're doing. Exactly, that's what they're doing, uh, because uh, the content of Russian media they just they break this picture, a really convenient picture of evil Russia that does evil just because it's evil. Don't try to even find logic here. Uh, so this is the the artificial environment that prevents the listener, well, the receiver of the information from most important thing, to ask questions. So that's what they're doing. Just stop asking questions. Just believe that Russia is evil. Just don't 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 even bother. 
facts. So you believe in a plurality of views? Yes, yes I do. And what's, what's the state of media in Russia though, where independent voices have been targeted and been removed? What, what is the state of, of media? Does, does the Russian state, the Russian Federation believe in freedom of the press? Yes, we do believe in freedom of the press. And there's still dozens of independent sources of information that's still online. Uh, well, there, there is a, it's a, again, uh, it's an issue that dates back uh, to earlier days before the special military operation, because we, we've been reproached for introducing the foreign agent status for certain media. Uh, but first of all, as our president said, it's not our invention. Uh, the U.S. does the same thing, and nobody has any problems with that, apparently. Uh, so they are, like still worship their free media, and no one's uh, no one's doubting, no one's asking about the free the freedom of speech in the U.S., for example. But that, are you, are let's you talking about President Trump banning certain media organizations from press conferences? Um, yeah, not exactly. But uh, well, I, I'm not especially I'm not specialist in U.S. law. I'm just quoting uh, what, my, what my president said. Uh, but the thing is that uh, status of foreign agent does not take you offline. You'll have to manifest that you're a foreign agent. They lost audience, right? But uh, it's fair competition. Uh, apparently, Russian audience just doesn't want to hear news from foreign agents. Wimbledon, Formula One, International Olympic Committee, and a host of other organizations, they've all banned Russian and Belarusian athletes uh, from participating in events. Russia was banned from the recent World uh, Economic Forum in Davos. Um, do you think that this achieves anything? Uh, should Russia be allowed to continue to interact in international platforms? Mm, yes, why not? Uh, well, if we're speaking about like Russia should be banned for you know for the situation in Ukraine, then first, U.S. and U.K. should be banned as well for what they did to Libya, for what they did to Yugoslavia, what they did to Iraq, what they did to you know back to the Cold War era, to Vietnam, to Cuba, and to uh, to other countries. They should be banned too. So at least be consistent with that. That's our first advice. Uh, secondly, sports is beyond politics, last, last time I checked. Uh, but it's not the reality, I'm afraid, uh, right today. Uh, because, well, we don't see that it's going to achieve anything good. I mean, banning from Formula One, uh, World Cups, and uh, sports competition. The entire Olympic movement was based and its credibility was based on the fact that it was beyond politics. It was a safe space where countries could still cooperate despite their political differences. That was the most valuable thing about global sports, to have this you know, common forum for everyone. Mm -hmm. Even the, in the sharpest periods of most acute uh, confrontation between the Soviet bloc and the capitalist bloc in, uh, in Cold War, we still had the opportunity to communicate through sports. It was an important channel of communication. Apparently, blocking Russia or banning Russian and Belarus for that matter only shows that the West is apparently building an iron curtain around itself. That's an interesting turn of phrase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, well, the, the facts speak, vo speak volumes. They just don't want to talk to Russia anymore. They're just like, well, mm. stay away from us. That's isolating. They say they will isolate Russia, but they isolate them themselves. Uh, let's bring things a little closer to home. South Africa, your home for the past five years, at least. I think we can all accept that there's a difference of opinion in South Africa um, about Russia's actions. Mm -hmm. The ruling party, the ANC and the EFF, EFF is very vocally in support of Russia. Uh, the Democratic Alliance, John Steenhuisen, he actually traveled to Ukraine. The DA is opposed to Russia's actions. For people who are unsure of what to think, mm -hmm. um, why should South Africans support Russia's actions? And should we support Russia at all? Or should we stay completely neutral? And do you think South Africa is neutral? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm not commenting... Sorry, lots of questions. Uh, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, let's take them one by one. So, first of all, uh, just for the record, I'm not commenting on any domestic politics in, in South Africa. Uh, it's purely South African business. And I'm 
okay. uh, putting myself uh, <laughs> away from it. Yeah. Not in a position to to make any comments on this one. We we are grateful for the support. We are grateful for the balanced uh, position uh, of South Africa. Of course, we're, we're grateful for any support coming to us. Uh, so yes, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, there are, there are differences of opinion, as you as you mentioned it. Uh, well, again, uh, not concentrating especially on domestic politics for the reasons I just yes. mentioned. Uh, we, we, as I said, we do believe in pluralism of opinions. It's okay that people uh, disagree, people argue, people uh, have different points of view on 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 certain events. It's totally okay with us. Uh, so. Yeah, so thank you for the for the balanced uh, approach. Do you believe the South African media has been balanced in its coverage of the Russia-Ukraine war, special military operation, Alex? Uh, well, it's uh, it depends on how do you count, what do you find as balanced uh, and what not, what's your system of coordinates. Uh, so to say, uh, well, of course, there there were uh, a lot of articles in South African media that were against uh, Russia, but uh, there are like several aspects to this. Uh, like first, they're using the the Western materials coming from Reuters, AFP, Washington Post, and stuff. So it's not so it's just a retranslation of the Western's position. Uh, well. There are media who are interested, well, like yourself, uh, who are interested in Russia's position, and we're grateful for the media who are interested in in Russia's position to give uh, their readers, their audience, a balanced approach uh, from the Ukrainian side and Russia's side, because this is basic journalism here, both sides of the story. So we're always, always open for the cooperation uh, with, with media. We're ready to share uh, our position, because that's the best we can do. Is just to share a position and, well, let the people decide what to think. Are you able to comment at all on the three foreign fighters sentenced to death by the Donetsk People's Republic uh, on terrorism charges? Um, um, to my mind, you have civilians, combatants. Uh, they've been charged on terrorism well, charges. Is there a comment you can uh, give me on well, that? Well, uh, not exactly a comment because I'm I'm a bit, bit limited uh, in this regard because I'm not representing DPR. Uh, so first of all, it's DPR's matter. Uh, a country so only recognized by Russia. It doesn't Isn't matter. It, is that not a problem? Uh, we we, re we recognize them, so that's their business. We count them. We count it as their business. Uh, so, secondly, according to international law, the foreign mercenaries are not regarded as combatants is this with with full uh, is fully in line with international law so there is nothing I illegal actually going on and our milit our minister of defense uh, during one of its briefings actually said that the foreign uh, mercenaries will not be regarded as combatants because international law does not regard them as such so that's uh, all, everything I can say. Uh, as for the legal proceedings uh, and sentences and uh, anything, it's it's DPR's matter. How long is this going to go on for? How long can Russia sustain this? It's it's hard to answer it directly. How long? Well, the the, the sooner it ends, the better, I guess, because well, there's no guessing about it. Sorry, uh, because well the. Yeah, the, the damages and the sufferings of people must, must end as soon as possible. That's why I mentioned that the Western supplies of weapons does not help us in this regard, because it's just further pour oils and flames of conflict. Uh, apparently, we will have to come up with, with, with solution one way or another. Diplomatic so or military Yes, of course solution. diplomatic. Of course diplomatic. Of course, diplomatic. We'll, we'll have to get, get to that at a certain point, because... Uh, Regardless of how acute the issues are now between the West and the Russia, Russia NATO in particular, Russia US, it also comes back to the diplomatic talks because we will have to somehow to determine what's what's next for us. The conflicts cannot uh, be permanent, and uh, so there there is a need for diplomatic solution. We understand that, and this is what we started with. We we originally wanted this to be diplomatically resolved. Uh, issue and we've been telling the the NATO that for 30 years that expanding eastwards will only cause problems, 
uh, we tell Ukrainians that uh, their anti-Russian position, their Russophobia, uh, their uh, massacre of uh, civilians will not going to end well. Uh, that this will huge. This will cause a crisis. Nobody was listening, unfortunately. Here's where here's where we are. There seems to be an upscaling in military action in the east and the south at the moment. If the two aims were to denazify and demilitarize, is Russia looking to succeed on those two and then sit down at the negotiations table? Or well, uh, well that's the, that's our objectives, uh, and these objectives, well, last time I checked, they were not cancelled. So yes, this objective must be fulfilled. And, and yes. So it must be to destroy the Ukrainian military capability and then to seek out everybody that Russia deems is a Nazi. Mm, it's to make them appeal to court and make them appear in court. Uh, it's not about uh, physical execution of everyone. Let's not represent it as something barbaric or medieval. No, uh, because even the Nazis of the Third Reich, they were bring to the, they were brought to the Nuremberg trials. So they must answer to the law. And they must answer before the before the people uh, that they were that they've been torturing and endangering all this time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.